Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Oz Gamers, The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt video review. You are here with Stephen Farrelly, managing editor of the site. I also have a written review, which we've already given the game a 10 out of 10 perfect score. You can find that review up on the site uh, right now at ozgamers.com under the review section. I'm going to kick things off now with Geralt, just running through this gorgeous landscape. Arguably the best landscape ever created in a video game. Uh, I spent most of my time playing the game on foot. Uh, you obviously have other m modes of transport, but similar to Red Dead Redemption, it just became more enjoyable to kind of take everything in, uh, in your own way, in your own pace, and the game really is as open as it is being touted as being. Now here's a quick look at the actual size of the map and land, and it's just full of things to do. Uh, I mentioned crafting before, You'll always find some plants or plant life to pick at. It's also rich with character. Uh, so many characters play integral parts in not just fleshing out the main story, but also fleshing out the world around you and helping with some exposition for uh, Geralt's past because a lot of people haven't played The Witcher 1 or haven't played The Witcher 2. And there is quite a lot of history in this series being delivered uh, through The Witcher 3 uh, that... Um, yeah, everybody kind of does need a bit of help learning. Now, you can almost look absolutely anywhere in this game and it's going to look like a postcard. Uh, I think the guys were listening when Rockstar mentioned that that was one of their design philosophies for GTA V. And it's absolutely paid off here. Uh, you come across villages and towns and whole cities. Uh, you can actually get on uh, boats and travel between provinces. Uh, and obviously you've got this go, uh, mode of transport here, uh, Roach, who is your trusty steed. Now, he's a quite a smart horse. He won't run into trees, he won't jump off a ledge, and he can't actually die. Now, this is just an example of a point of interest. One of the design philosophies that CD Projekt Red uh, set out to do with The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt was to give the player something to look at on the horizon and feel like they could go down there and, and engage with it. And this is one example. In this instance, while we were capturing this video, I hadn't actually come across this space before. Uh, so I have no idea, or at this stage, I had no idea what level this monster was, what even the monster actually was. Uh, so we just engaged in the fight anyway. Now, combat is a pretty interesting component to The Witcher 3. There's, I wrote an article a little while ago about uh, how I thought they could have adopted the Batman combat style instead of uh, having it as simple input as they had but it turns out that I was incorrect and the way that these guys did it is actually really really great uh, so yeah you, you have signs so uh, Geralt just used Igni there which is his uh, flame sign you can bolster these signs as you go through the game uh, and you also have items so on the top of the wheel is uh, all your signs and the bottom of the wheel is all your items now not every item is a an item for fighting sometimes they're used to communicate with the dead, to communicate with other characters. Uh, one of them is just the general torch, and they're interchangeable as well. So whatever you put in there isn't locked into that position. So we're gonna have a quick look at the menu here. Now, we've just pulled up the character progression screen. On the left, you've got your attributes, which you can bolster with uh, ability points that you earn. And as you can see, they're all color-coded. On the right, you've got your ability tree. The diamond shape there is your mutagens. Mutagens buff particular parts of the character, and they're interchangeable but they're also color coded to some of the attributes that you uh, can interchange as well. So it means that the character uh, really needs to be looked at in terms of what the quest is, what the level of the you know, particular monster you might actually be fighting actually is. We just had a quick look at quests there. Quests are quite easy to track, but it's this particular area of the menu that is probably the most difficult to wrap your head around, especially early on in the game. It's very intimidating. There's a lot of space. You do collect a lot of stuff. A lot of it is junk. A lot of it is important. There is a very, very big emphasis in uh, The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt on reading. Now, certain quests won't even trigger unless you've read a book or a page from a letter that you found out in the, out in the wild. Uh, out in the world, you might p pick up a, a signpost, and you can't actually do anything unless you've actually read that. It's a very important part of the game, and it sort of leads into the factor that uh, Geralt is a bit of a... He's a bit of a detective, and it's really important. Now, you can craft. Uh, we've talked about crafting a little bit, and as an alchemist, Geralt is capable of crafting, but he can't craft everything.
you will need to go to particular uh, specialists within the game world in order to craft things like weapons and armor, which changes it up a little bit from another game like Skyrim, where you could become a bit of a jack of all trades. The point of The Witcher is to really attach yourself to this world. You're not really here to dominate the world as such. Geralt already has his place within this world as a Witcher. He's already got his profession. So it's really important for the developers and for the player to really understand that uh, you need to actually explore the, the space in order to uh, get the best out of it. On top of that, there are different levels of crafters in the world. So you're not always going to be able to go back to the same blacksmith so that he can continue to create the best weapons and armor for you. Now, The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt is an open world game, which means most of the game is open to you. But I emphasize most because there are certain parts of the world that you just can't go to. Coming up here, we won't actually get to it because I died, but there is a monster guarding a chest. Now, this is another point of interest. You can see those birds flapping off into the distance there, and that tower, it just drew me to the spot. Now, the monster's off to the left. But what I really wanted to point out is this. While, as I pointed out, the game is open world, and you can effectively go anywhere, it doesn't necessarily mean you're always going to discover what is meant to be there to be discovered. In this instance, I came across this isolated shack. Now with telekinesis, you can break down specific doors and certain walls and use your witcher senses to work out which, uh, what's destructible. So we go outside and it's a bit ominous. There's a blood stain. I use my witcher senses, nothing. Now normally what would happen is something that you could actually detect in witcher uh, sense mode is, is glowing quite red. It's uh, basically like a moth to a flame type of thing. So we come around here and we explore and obviously people have been living here. You know, there's fire, there's fish, there's uh, signs of life, skinning, fires are on again inside. But once again, once we use our Witcher Sense, there's just nothing here. The problem is, you actually trigger this quest much later on. And it sort of happens a little bit in the game world. If you get ahead of yourself, you'll actually lose out on the ability to discover some of these things more emergently. And it's something that I touched on in my written review. There is a sort of a set uh, checklist to the way some of these uh, missions play themselves out, at the very least early on in the game. Now I have played quite a lot, and later on things do tend to come to you a bit more organically, but it just felt like early on they could have nailed the emergent play a little bit better. And it's unfortunate in this instance that coming across such a crazy, ominous, you know, place with blood and a, a destructible door and a cave underneath that I really didn't get anything out of it. And then once the quest had actually triggered, I came back and was like, oh, that's what it was. So that surprise was also gone for me, which is part of that emergent play that I've been talking about. Now we're going to round out the review looking at some of the environments and another encounter. Uh, we haven't really talked about cities yet and a lot of what we captured early on was really sort of low level stuff. The idea there wasn't so much that um, you know we hadn't gotten very far in the game, it's that a lot of this game is about discovery and we wanted to leave it up to you guys to, uh, to kind of really get to on your own. But this is Novigrad and it's sort of a really big indication of just even in the cities how unbelievably detailed and, and askew everything is, you know, there's no real structure to how this city is planned and that's an important factor. Uh, and obviously, you know, just every minute detail, there really hasn't been an open world game outside of the GTA series and, um, and potentially Red Dead Redemption uh, that has had this level of fidelity. Obviously Skyrim was, was great uh, and, and Fallout before it, but those games are kind of largely built more around the the single player experience being one of a journey that they've created. And the best part here is what we are, is we're experiencing a Geralt of Rivia uh, journey. Now, we wanted to uh, top it all off with a boat ride. Uh, and boats are damageable, as you can see. I was just looking at the, uh, at the bow there. This is a boat I've been riding around in a little bit earlier. Um, the wind apparently is quite magic around these boats because you can just turn on a dime and 
that uh, sail will do whatever it needs to do as long as you're holding down the X button or uh, the A button on the Xbox One or I assume A button on your keyboard for PC. Uh, and we're going to top it off as I mentioned with a bit of a uh, battle. We came across this actually in closing out this, uh, this video capture piece. We wanted to jump in the water, show you a bit of the boat riding and just kind of the exploratory emergent gameplay. Again, I keep using that word, but it's really important in an open world game for a player to be able to come across something on their own and discover things as as if they were, you know, the progenitor of that and not so much being led there by the hand of the developer. Now, this is a slightly higher level monster than what we've ever faced uh, in any of the stuff we've shown earlier, uh, but that's for good reason. And we're going to just let this battle play out. Uh, you know most of the pieces of the puzzle so far. Obviously there's a treasure here. And uh, we've got, you know, abilities and signs. Uh, we're a bit higher level here. We've got better armor. Uh, our sword is equipped correctly. And uh, this is a very angry beast. As this battle comes to a close, it's really important to point out a few things. There are some structural components to The Witcher 3 that aren't necessarily absolute, they're not the best in the business, but they do work very well for this game. We also wanted to point out <laughs> that you can call your horse even on a remote island, even though he didn't come with you on a boat, which is pretty funny. And obviously it sort of speaks volumes about the freedom that the developers have given. It, but we're going to finish it off with the fact that, you know, despite a couple of uh, questionable components here, this is one of the best games we've ever played. 10 out of 10.